Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us here. We have something special for you. We have our special guest for Sacred Conversations. It's just a bunch of people sitting on the couch uh, talking about life, talking about, um, about Jesus, about our faith, and about some, uh, some issues surrounding the church, some issues surrounding our communities, and uh, what we can do as Christians uh, to better serve the kingdom. Uh, so we have a special guest this week, Justin Coleman. He's our Director of Development here at Orange County. Uh, he's such an amazing guy. I'm so excited to hear his story. Um, yeah, so just uh, just stay tuned for that. Uh, how exciting. We're going to come to you shortly now. Fantastic to be here once again in our sacred conversation. And today we've got a good friend of mine, of ours. In fact, he's a friend of all of ours, uh, Justin Coleman. Justin works for the Salvation Army. Uh, and Justin has an amazing story, and we want to really press in and continue to understand the challenges of living in a biracial family, the challenges of living being a person of color, of different race, what implications that it has for us today. So Justin, welcome. Thanks, Captain. It's good to be here. It's good to see you guys. You always look fantastic. Now, I want to get <laughs> this important question out of the way right off the top. You dress probably the most stylish I've ever seen anyone. <laughs> What's the backstory for the suits, the breast you know, coats? It, it, uh, it's a family thing, actually. You know, it's, it's, it's a family thing that was passed down from my grandfather to my dad. To me, it was just something that we were always taught to, to look our best and present our best. So, you I know, love it. It's one I of love things it. That, that's been encouraged. I don't know if the cameraman can get a close-up into your look at those beautiful <laughs> shoes he's wearing. And, I don't know if I shine him uh, today. I mean, yeah, his Boy. son. When I see his son in his office, I'm like, dude, man, this guy is like, he's on, he's on fire. Yeah, <laughs> it's passed down. You know, it is passed down. It is passed yeah. down. It's a, it's a generational trait. So I, I love those generational traits. I think they're important. But we're here for some important conversations. Yes. And Justin, tell us a little bit about your story. No, I'd love to. You know, my story. I, I feel you know, is my story is very unique, um, because of the time and the area and the generation I was born into. Uh, I was born in 1972, but uh, the circumstances were, were not ideal. Uh, my mother was 15 years old, uh, Italian, American uh, woman, young lady at the time, uh, and she had gotten pregnant uh, by an African American black man in the, in the community. And um, that just didn't happen then. It, it just wasn't something that white people were dating black people, black people were dating white people. It wasn't encouraged, it wasn't something that was promoted. Um, and my mom found herself pregnant with me at 15 years old. And so, you, you know, you think about that in your mind, 15 years old, I try to go back and, you know, we're, we're just, we, we don't know much at all. We're young, um, we're impressionable. And uh, she was found, you know, pregnant. And she had a big dilemma on what she was supposed to do. And uh, there was a lot of pressure from her family being of Af Italian American descent that uh, she was not supposed to have me or going to have me. Uh, it was it was pretty much mandated from her father, telling her that there would never be a day that he would have, and I'll say the word, a nigger in his home, wow. that that was never going to happen. When he found out that the biological father, my dad, uh, was black and uh, of African American descent, he said that will never ever happen while I'm alive. And so here's my mom faced with this challenge of, of what am I supposed to do? Yeah. And uh, you know, I I look up to my mom as one of the most courageous women in this world. She said. I'm going to have this child regardless of what you say. I will not abort it. And my grandfather tried to take her to have an abortion on several times. My mom ran away from home. Uh, she hid. She did anything she could to try to preserve the life that she knew that was inside of her. And um, so, you know, long story short, she, she had me. She carried me to term. But the day that I was birthed at the hospital, I was taken right from her hands. Uh, she never got to hold me. They took me away from her immediately. And I was put in foster care for almost a year. Uh, after that. And uh, the story is very unique because my grandmother uh, was a woman of faith. And uh, even though she um, had never really had an experience with an African American culture or, or known anyone who was, who was black, um, she knew that I was her grandson. And she knew that she had a grandson out there somewhere in the world. And she prayed. And, and she tells me, you know, she's still alive today. She's 96 years old. And she said, wow. I'll never forget the prayers, you know, kneeling beside my bed every night and just praying that God would protect you, that God would keep you, that somehow we would find you again and bring you back into our home. And it came down to a conversation that she had with my grandfather. She said flat out, either you go and he comes or, you know, that, that, that's the only answer is that that child is coming home here to live with wow. us. And uh, there was a lot of wrestling going on there in that house. <laughs> so, so, Justin, which part of the United States 
did you grow up in? I was born in Pennsylvania, northwestern Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh area. And what was the political climate or the in Pennsylvania at that time? Yeah, again, you know, knowing from, from what I've heard and growing up, you know, at that time, you know, the whole crossing of races just wasn't something that, that happened. You know, there was a community, a section of our town was where the African Americans, where black people mostly lived. Uh, and then there was a section of the town where, you know, you didn't cross over. That's, that's where the white people lived. And so the fact, again, that my mom had kind of crossed over and broke that barrier was a huge piece. It, it, was, the, it was the talk of the town. It, it was... You know, it wasn't something that was common and happening on an everyday basis. And so the climate, again, was not to have this happen. And it shouldn't have never happened. Um, so there was a lot of circumstances around it that I've really felt that, uh, you know, were influencing my mom, influencing the culture, influencing the environment uh, to keep me from coming in this world. But, you know, God had bigger plans. Would you say that your mom then... Because she obviously was in a relationship with a black man. Would, yes. at, at that time, was she more, I guess, in modern day terms, progressive or more liberal, <laughs> more, more willing to kind of yeah. go against the cultural bias and the preferences? Like, say, no, no, whites stay with whites, Italians stay with Italians, you know? Yeah, I, I think my mom, you know, she described it. She said, my, she would always say she liked what she liked, you know, and that, was, and that was it. You know, she said, hey, you know, I fell in love with this man whether he was black or white, I just knew I loved him. And again, you know, she was 15, you're, you're young. And so, um, but that, that was always the way she would express herself is that, you know, I always knew what I liked and I liked your dad, you know, he charmed me, he wooed me, he got Listen, me. We, we can understand that, right? Right. Black men are attractive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly it. So um, your grandma brought you home? My grandma, yes. My grandmother went into the foster care system and through uh, various uh, circumstances and networking was able to find me uh, in the system before I was put up for adoption. And she brought me home. And, um, and they say that, you know, the day she brought me home, my grandfather literally just melted, that I became the apple of his eye. Uh, wow. You know, and, and I don't remember him. I never really got to know him. He passed away uh, when I was about three years old. But uh, the stories that they tell, the pictures that I see of him holding me, you know, there's always, there was like a, a light in his eye that I was his grandson. He didn't see me as that word that he had previously used. You know, when he had said, there will never be a nigger in my home. He didn't see me as being that. He saw me as being a part of him, as grandson. But it took that act of being courageous for my grandmother to put her foot down and, and cross that line and say, this is our grandson, yeah. regardless of what color he is, no matter what he looks like, he's coming here and we're going to raise him. What do you think changed for your grandfather? What actually happened for him? You know, that, that's a great question. I think what happened um, was the, the, the color factor was taken away. You know, what he saw was he saw a reflection of himself. Uh, if you see pictures of him today and me, we, we favor each other a lot. We look just like one another. And so I think what he saw was, number one, he had three daughters. And so he saw, this is almost a son to me. You know, this is the, the son I never had. Um, he saw, you know, a human being. He, he saw a young baby. And, and it wasn't about color to him anymore, in, even though, you know, again, I don't know the whole story that surrounded. I, I think that he had friends that he, uh, I heard that he still didn't take me around. And there were people that he didn't fully expose me to. But in the home, I was his grandson. You know, but at the time in the culture, it was it was still, it was still you know, uh, taboo. You know, it was still it was still not something that was embraced, especially for an Italian American and the culture. You know, there it just wasn't embraced. Justin, that's a you make some really, really insightful comments there, and there's some powerful things that you're saying in your response, mm -hmm. because one of the biggest challenges is that people of color have been dehumanized. Yes. Uh, in, in many parts of the world where we've seen colon, colonization, uh, the native parts, uh, natives in each of those countries, whether it's uh, Indian Americans or whether it's uh, Africans in West Africa or South Africa or Central Africa mm -hmm. or wherever it is, they've been dehumanized and it's interesting for you to say that your grandfather saw you as a human being. Yes, yeah, and, and that's, I think that was the changing factor, was he didn't see me as that, that, that word, that, that word that he didn't even know anything about. He didn't even understand the culture, he didn't know the people. He just knew that word and what was associated with that. Um, 
and once he saw me as a human being, it, it changed his heart. You know, his heart, it, it began with a change of his heart. And that, and that then led for me to become the apple of his eye, as I'm, as I'm told in the stories of this day from my family members. So what happened with your African-American family? <laughs> you, know, they, I, you know, they embraced me right away. I, I think my African-American side of my family uh, saw me as, you know, as being one of them for initially, that there, there was never a hesitation. There was never, you know, he's white, um, you know, so we're, we're going to treat him differently. So it was, it was very interesting. Uh, growing up, being biracial is a very interesting way to grow up because you're exposed to very two different cultures. And I think uh, the African-American side of my family embraced me much more readily than the, uh, the white side of my family did, you know, just because uh, I, I think they, they resonated with the fact that they were dehumanized, that they were looked differently, and they didn't want me to grow up that way. Yeah, so you were in foster care for a year. Yeah, almost a year. Almost a year, mm -hmm. and then you went home to live with an Italian. When, yeah, with an Italian-American family. Yeah. Uh, and so that was very interesting. Yeah, so you know, and that, and that's, that was really the majority where I was raised on the Italian-American family side of, of my home. Uh, but, you know, I was exposed to my dad's side on a regular basis. You know, so it was, I would be at my grandmother's house one day and then be at the other grandmother's house the next day. So I was getting this, this back and forth, you know, mix of cultures. Uh, which, again, I think has made me who I am today. Yeah. So, Justin, one of the uh, interesting questions that people often ask mm -hmm. is, did you see yourself as mm -hmm. African-American or did you see yourself as Caucasian-American? Did you see yourself as black or white? Right. Uh, how, how were you reconciling that? Yeah. That's, that was probably one of the, the most difficult things, I think, growing up to reconcile with because I didn't know. I, I honestly, I probably didn't really begin to identify with anything because the culture didn't allow you to. And I'll give an example. You know, in, in grade school, you'd take these tests and they'd make you say black, white, other. Yes. You know, you'd have, you'd have to check yes. a box. And I'm sitting there and, I, and I'm like, what box do I check? And the teacher would tell me, you, you can't check both. And I'm like, so, so what do I pick, you know? And they said, well, you know, pick, pick other. So I was always told to pick other. And so that psychologically plays a mindset in you because you can't really identify, especially as a young man growing up, a, a child, who am I? You know, because there, there comes a, a whole piece of, of your identity based on your culture, based on your race. But when you're being told to put yourself in a box that's other, what does other mean? What, who, so am I anything? And, and you begin to, that psychologically begins to play with you, I think. So it wasn't until probably later in my teen years that I started to identify more. And, you know, I began to check the black box. I, I just felt more comfortable. I felt more comfortable in my environment and the, my friends who I was hanging around with, my family members, that I, I started associating myself more with being black. Even though I identified with the white side of the family, I was with them constantly, but the black part just felt more natural for me and honestly more comfortable to say that I was black. Yeah, I think there's a pressure for us to identify people. Uh, I think it rang home for me when we're filling out a census in Australia mm -hmm. and it asked for the heritage of the people who lived in the house. So right. for me, it's English and I'm English. And then for Nursa, it's South African. Mm -hmm. But for our children, it's Indian, right. South African, <laughs> English, and they were born in Australia. So right. we ran, I actually ran out of space of because you have to like write it in in the boxes mm -hmm. <laughs> like right. running out of space because there's this pressure you know to conform and there's this pressure that like you're either this or you're that you can't be all of those things and and what does all of those things mean right you know, exactly yeah yeah and, and i and i felt that you know and that was the pressure that i would feel as, as a child and even in my teen years and you know what what am i you know because there was a pressure i could I, I couldn't be all these things they weren't giving me an option to be all these things that's right they were just saying you have to pick black white or other there was nothing else on the boxes yeah. you know when we were taking these tests when we were in school they didn't give us another choice so and other it, is an issue isn't it and other is it, it is an issue uh, for me other yeah. is an issue i have other. a real issue with other uh, yeah, and I didn't know anything better than to say other because we weren't taught. There was nobody there to guide us. Yeah. There was no one there to tell us, you know, what, well, what do you think? There was no guidance for us at all. Yeah. So you, you just had to go with what, you know, the pressure was put on you and you had to get the test filled out and you had to identify it, so you just checked the box. And, but that psychologically would play in your mind. Then you'd walk out of the room and you'd be like, so what am I? I, yeah. I, I don't know. And, and it, was, it was hard to decipher. I think the beautiful thing in the kingdom of God is he doesn't have another. He has the fact that he 
made you, he, he, that you're That's loved, right. you're created in his image. And for God, there is no other. There's no black. There's no white. You're just a child of God. And I think for me, when I was thinking about my children as... Um, you know, we're growing our family. How would we, what would be the best way mm -hmm. to describe our children? And I always tell my children, you are created in yes. love. You are created in God's image. God has a plan and he has a purpose for your life. It doesn't matter what everybody else says about you. All that matters is what God says about you. That's right. You know, yes. it's God's thing. Um, I, just before we moved here three years ago, we went to a I went to a Hillsong service in Sydney um, with Josh and Faith and the preacher of the day was Craig Groeschel mm -hmm. and Faith was sitting there and three years ago she was eight years old and she remembers what that preacher said that preacher said um, it doesn't matter the names that the world gives you the only mm -hmm. thing that matters in this world is the name that God gives you That's right. and I, I think as she's growing and developing like even now three years later she's she said Craig Groeschel tells me that the only name that matters is the name that God gives me mm -hmm. and I think yes. like listening to your story and thinking about my children's story and a nurse's story I think we really need to keep reaffirming to people it doesn't matter what the world says That's about right. you. It only matters what God says about you. That's and right. God says you are a child of the King. You're adopted in my family. You have a place, a home mm -hmm. in heaven. You are an heir of righteousness. Yes. And I think we have to remember that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and sure, you're 100% right, because that is true, because the gospel is true. But Justin, uh, growing up, uh, wrestling with identity, mm -hmm. uh, Tell me some of the interactions you had. Obviously, uh, there's interactions that you have at school. Yes. There's interactions you have with friends and peers. Yes. Interactions you have with different authorities, whether it's teachers, mm -hmm. uh, law, and um, the world. Tell us some of the interactions you had where that brought your identity into conflict. Yeah, well, I think there was, there was a lot, you know, growing up in my childhood, I was able... Uh, to see from both both perspectives, I think being again having the black background, the white background, I was I was exposed to two different worlds. You know, literally, I got to see into two different worlds in two different perspectives. Because I'd be with friends who were black who would talk a certain way and say certain things about the white race, and then I'd be with friends who were white and say certain things, and even family members who would say certain things. So, so I had an inside exposure almost because they would just look at me and whoever I was with. They didn't identi I identified with them. Um, so I think, you know, some of the interactions I had growing up that I remember, you know, kind of profoundly were, you know, the, the question I would get asked by friends, you know, what would you rather be, black or white? Wow. And, and that, was, that, that was a hard question. Yeah. You know, you're sitting there like, well, I'm, I'm just me. But they'd ask this question, you know, like, what do you mean, what would I rather be? I mean, this is who I am. You know, my father's black, my mother's white. I don't know how to answer that. But you would get those type of questions and again, that would cause you to wrestle with your identity. Well, okay, why, should I have to choose one or the other? You know, I mean, am I feeling this peer pressure that I need to identify with one race or the other? But so those type of questions would come across, you know, quite frequently, you know, more from the white side of my, my friendships, you know, that they would ask me those type of questions. And I'd find that always kind of curious. Why do you even ask me that? You know, what, what does that concern you? And uh, I'm sorry. Maybe, they, maybe they, they're coming from a place of, Maybe it's just better to be a white man in America versus be. being a black man in America. And so they're asking, hey, yeah. Justin, you know, what would your life be like if you just only identified as a white man? Or yeah. how much more difficult would your life look like if you just identified as a black man? Yeah. Um, there's that idea of, of, you know, as a white man in America, you have greater access. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, a, a far, later, far less resistance and upward mobility versus being a black man in America. Mm. Um, yeah, like, yeah. How, like yeah. in your professional experience yeah. growing up, like how have you encountered that kind of resistance <laughs> as a black man or as a white man or someone in between? Like, Yeah, that's a great question. From a professional standpoint, you know, I, I think that it's, um, I haven't run into a conflict, honestly, from a professional standpoint in, in my previous employment. I've never had a problem with someone looking at me and, and saying anything to me directly. Now, it doesn't mean it wasn't done, you know, off the, indirectly, but, you know, directly. But, but I have, you know, I get that, that, but I do get that subtle question all the time is, what are you? 
And and that 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 always surprises me. That curiosity that people want to know and and why that matters, you know, so much. But there's that curiosity where I'll be sitting at lunch. Uh, and someone will look across the table and say, yeah, can you, what, "What nationality are you?" You know, and I'm like, you know, like, okay, you know, what that answer would from? you give them? Yeah, well, you know, and I kind of run through them all. Like Captain Cheryl was saying, I kind of, you know, I'm African American, I'm Italian, I'm German, I'm, you know, I kind of run through them all. I'm a mix of everything, you know. But it's interesting that people will go out of their way to ask you a question like that, you know, just out of the blue. And so I, I, I always, you know, pro, you know, makes me scratch my head a little bit and say, I'm, "Where's that coming from? Why? You know, why? Why are you asking that?" And I think for me, you know, there's been some times where I've asked people, you know, why? Why are you asking? And they, you know, and I, I think I throw them off guard with that because they're kind of like, well, I, I was just curious, you know. You know, you, you look Italian or, you know, they, they throw something out there and so you kind of go with it. But it always, it always, you know, baffles me a little bit why people want to know. Why does that even matter? You know, but I think it's just a natural curiosity uh, that, that's come about in my life where people have asked me that. Labels are important to people, right? People like labels. Why do you think people like labels, Cheryl? I don't know that... I think people like conformity. It's not necessarily yeah. about labels. They like... I don't know. I don't, and I don't understand why mm -hmm. it's so. Like, you talked a, a little while ago about, oh, there was this line that you just didn't cross in right. my community. Right. Um, I think it matters less now, like, those kind of things. I think, um, well, from my perspective... I think it matters less now. I don't mm -hmm. think it's it's as important. Although Nosa and I kind of face these similar kind of conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember my parents were asked when we were dating, like, "Oh, what happens if they get married?" And my mum and dad go, "Well, they get married." And they go, "But what happens if they get married and they have children and then they divorce? Who will want the children?" Mm. And my parents are like, "Well." I don't know. I think everybody would want the children. We, you love children because they're children. Right. Like for them, it wasn't right. so incredibly important. But I guess they were talking about um, pe their peers. Mm -hmm. You know, and my parents are born in the 40s. So the people of their age are carrying those things. I think now for our kids, I don't know how you find with your children, but I think it matters less. I think people are much more open and much more willing. Yes. Yeah, I, I see that completely with my children. You know, that, that there's no... Um, I mean, and I think because today, again, it's more common now to see families who are biracial. You see it on TV, you see commercials, you see yes. the kids. I mean, it's almost embraced. There, there's, a, there's almost a, yeah. a, a beauty to it, almost, you know, that, that I'm seeing that people are, are embracing it more. Um, and they're not questioning it as much as when my time, when I was growing up and the experiences yeah. I had. Because, again, it was a weird situation. And, Captain, you asked me, you know, some of the experiences being in school when, you know, you were the only kid you know, had the, the big curly, you know, don't have as much hair now. Yeah, but what's happened but, to all that but, curly but hair? <laughs> curly and, and, you know, everyone's getting their picture taken and your hair, you know. <laughs> and, and, you know, the people would ask you, you know, like, let me, let me feel your hair. Like, why do you want to feel my hair? They, it was just this curiosity yeah. because you were something different that they just weren't used to being around. And I think that that then lends to this kind of unconscious biased opinion of people because they're not used to being around people of something uh, of another culture and I think that I was kind of that that stare that that you know for my generation and my area where I was raised in uh, I was breaking some barriers there because I, I was unique so Justin how did the community I mean you mentioned it a bit but I want to press in a little bit how yeah. did the community respond to your father mm. who's African-American yes. who's impregnated a white mm -hmm. girl I don't even know what the age difference were. Was uh, it? Two years. My father, years. he was 17. She he was 17. Mm -hmm. She was 15. Yes. How did the community respond to him? Yes. Uh, very negatively. I mean, my, my father, I don't think him, uh, from what I'm told and what I, you know, the history was, my, him and my grandfather never spoke. My grandfather never invited him into the home, um, never had any dialogue or conversation with him. Um, and, you know, so I think my, my father was, was very absent, obviously, in my younger years because of the nature of the, the home I was being brought up in. You know, even though my grandmother had, had broke that barrier and said, we're going to bring this child home, yes. she didn't welcome my father with that. She right. welcomed me into the home, but she did right. not welcome my father and his family with it. So there was still... So was it a racial thing or was it the fact that my 15-year-old mm. daughter is pregnant that, you know. and, and <laughs> she's not married and, right. you know, um, or is it a combination of it all? I think it was a combination of it all. I just yeah. Think it, yeah, truly, if you think of a 15-year-old girl and, and just, you know, that, that whole stereotype of my daughter's pregnant, she's 15, biracial baby, um, 
I think it was a whole mix of it. And uh, but yeah, but so I was welcome in. But yeah, the rest of the family. So the grandparents was, didn't talk to each other. They did later on. I, later I, have, on. I have some of the most beautiful pictures of my two grandmothers together that that uh, are just mean the world to me because wow. yeah. you just see them. They they literally became the best of friends as I got older. They you know grandparents stay at school. They'd both come and sit with me and yeah. at different events. And so you saw them. And the thing that intertwined them was they were both women of faith, um, and they would talk about God with each other. You yeah. know? And then you saw the two families begin to interact yeah. as I got older. But in the early years, probably until I was probably about 9 or 10, you didn't see as much interaction. As I got older, you saw the embracement of each other more. And so with your father, you're saying he's absent like for much of your early life. How do you, do you Did you get to a point of reconciliation? Did you get um, to a point where you have a relationship of any kind of Yes. Oh, level? Yeah. yeah, later on in life, my father and I did. But it wasn't until probably my early 20s. You know, my father had a, a very difficult uh, upbringing, you know, himself, uh, battled with drug addiction and alcoholism, was in and out of prison. Mm. Um, and so there was, there was a whole disconnect you know, with him just because of the lifestyle that, that he had ended up choosing and going down that we really didn't connect until later in life. Um, but his family I connected very well with. Again, my grandmother, my aunts and uncles were always there. You know, they, they were some of my biggest champions and cheerleaders that I just naturally felt comfortable. You know, when I, when I showed up at their home, mm. it was always a, a warm welcome. There was never a pause or hesitation. Yeah. It was always like, Justin's here, you know, and, and that just made you feel like this is home. Yeah. You know, whether it's the black family or the white side of the family, it, it was home to me. Yeah. yeah. So how does your mother now deal with the fact that her baby was taken from her, oh. that her grandma goes back to get it, her mother yeah. goes back to get it? You, you know, know? My, my, mom, my mom said she, you, you could just never put it in words as, as a mother, you know, to, yeah. to have a baby and, and go through what she did to bring me into this world and then to not be able to hold me from the time that she had me until almost a year later. She said there, there was just a never an emptiness that she could she could describe, you wow. know, that, yeah. but she just... She knew that she had to bring me in this world. That's all she, she yeah. always tells me today if I ever, you know, get on my high horse and complaining about, you know, life. She says, you know, you were brought into this world and I went through a lot to bring you into this world. So yeah. remember that. So and was so, that her parents' decision for her or was it a government decision for her or was, that was it? That was her parents' decision. That was a uh, parental decision. That, my, that was my grandfather's decision. You know, so a 15-year-old, you get no choice. 15-year-old, you get no choice. You know, you're living in my home uh, and, and again at that day and age and time. You know, my mom was 15. She was probably a freshman in high school, you know, maybe yeah, mm -hmm. freshman uh, in high school. And so, you know, there, there was no other solution. It's either she's going to be out in the street with a baby at 15 in the early 70s or I'm going to stay in my parents' home. Were the schools seg still segregated in the 70s at that time? You know, um, not that I recall. I mean, I remember going to preschool and, and again, there wasn't. Uh, many that uh, I use the word looked like me, you know, I, I, it was different, you know, they're just, there were, there were kids who were black, there were kids who were white, but there weren't many kids who were biracial at right. the time. They're just, it was me and, and I'm still one of my best friends this day. We've grew up together since kindergarten and he's biracial. And, uh, you know, they used to make, uh, you know, it was, it was an odd joke, but they'd make the joke that the two of us made one black guy or the two of us <laughs> made one white guy, you know. It's fraction, fractional. It was a fractional half, thing. Half you know, you put the two of you together, oh, we got, you're, you're white. You put the two of you together, you're black. And it was kind of that ongoing joke because we both grew up together in the same school system. And, you know, that was a blessing to even have someone even go through this with. And but neither of us knew how to na navigate it. You know, when teachers would speak to us in a certain way, coaches would treat us a certain way. Um, but the sports thing played a big part in our life because I think in the sports world, we identified more with the African-American part um, okay. because, you know, for us uh, at that time, African-American athletes seemed to get more attention for whatever They were accepted. Reason. They were more accepted. It was, it was yeah. more acceptance. You know, you played a sport, you're a football player, you're a track, you're an athlete. You were more accepted, you know, than, than for your color, you mm -hmm. know, and you were treated differently. Um, and at my time growing up, you were treated with much more kind of almost on a pedestal, you know, versus the earlier days with, you know, Jesse Owens and uh, Jackie Robinson, those guys, the barriers, they had a break. At, at my age, when you became an athlete and if you were somewhat decent of an athlete, you know, almost put on a pedestal. Yeah. And wow. so it kind of broke that barrier that, oh, you're, you're black, but that's OK, you're black. You can run really fast or you can jump really high. So it's a can stereotype. Throw really far. Yeah, it was a stereotype. But as a black man, you can never be a good accountant or, right. or, or we, a CEO or a... We were never taught that, yeah. you know, and that was one thing I, I recognized. Throw ball, you, right. can, you, can, you can throw ball, you can run, you can, run, yeah. you can do these things, but the, the accounting piece, the financial part, that's something that I look at now and wanting to instill in my children because growing up in the African-American community, we didn't have these figures to give back and show us that. We were being seen and watching a lot of our, you know, in our community, men 
go to the route of being in prison, you know, being on the street stealing drugs. We weren't seeing. So criminal. why are the fathers absent? You know, what, what's, co- what, know, what's yeah, driving that? Because everyone says, oh, they make a choice. And I'm like, yeah. well, no, I don't think at some point, yes, they do make a choice, but at an, on a whole nother level, there's none of these role models like you're talking about. There's none of these right. people who have done really well in society, who are being celebrated for their intelligence, uh, who are just seen as great guys. Yeah. I mean, it just seems that there's a lack. And why is it that guys are absent? It's... Uh, Yes, some people have chosen that lifestyle, mm-hmm. but for others, I don't think, like I'm, I'm wrestling with it because I don't see yeah. that they've chosen it. I think it's just been inflicted upon them. I feel it is. I feel, you know, society, again, is, is almost putting you uh, and not opening the doors. I, th- I think for me watching it growing up and the friends that I had who were African-American who chose to go different routes, it was almost that society guided them almost down those routes. It was almost encouraged for them to do the wrong thing instead of the right thing. It's hard to explain, but I look back at some of the guys I grew up with and and where they are today, you know, where they had the same opportunities that I had, but yet they were ended up in a different route. And, it, and it's almost that... It's a rig. It, it almost feels like yeah. it. I, 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 you know, to or say that, that word, it could almost feel like it. You know, Or you make a little mistake and, oh, we expected, you, we expected you to do that. You're, you're no good. Look, right. you're just like everybody else and you're going to be here. You're not given that second and third chance. Yeah. You or know? You, you can be better than this. You, you can end up in jail or you can be better than this. And right. they're not given that thing. It's always like, oh, oh you've, you've done some shoplifting. Well, right. you're, a th- you're a hardcore thief now. But, but yeah. I think one of the things, too, you know, is that you grow up in what you're seeing. And, and for me growing up, my experience seeing my dad was behind a glass wall on a phone at a yeah. prison. Yeah. So here I am. This, is, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm growing up going to visit my dad. I'm not going to visit my dad and go to the park or go to his office <laughs> and sit there and watch him. And, and that's one of the reasons I bring my son around me so much. And you guys see him here on campus. I want him to see his dad at work in a professional environment interacting with people where I didn't get that chance to see that. I got to see my dad. How old were you when you saw your dad being a prison? It it started at a a young age. I mean, probably from the time I can remember back to four on up to 18. Really? You know, my father was was in and out of prison on on a regular basis. And so that was my visits with him. So did he ever turn his life around? He did. He did. My father did. Yeah. And what happened? What what was it? What was the catalyst? The catalyst for my father was, again, stopping the substance abuse. He he was was a uh, hardcore heroin addict. That was his his, uh, choice of drug. And it wasn't until, uh, yeah, I was about 21 years old where he finally got clean. And once that, that mentality changed in his life, mm. um, then you saw that change in his life. You know, I, I just had a net. My nephew was just here with me visiting for the last week. And he, we were talking just the other day. He goes, I could never, I never could picture, he calls him, you know, Papa being like that. And I said, yeah, you, you, you knew a totally different man, you know, than <clears> I did. He did change his life. And I'm, and I'm blessed and I'm grateful that you didn't know what I got to see growing up. Um, so it's interesting to watch my kids, you know, talk about their grandfather you know, saying that we didn't see him like that, yeah. but but I did. You know, yeah. unfortunately, my sister and I did, mm. and there were repercussions for that. You know, there were there were choices we made in our lives. You know, yeah. because that's what we saw. That's what we thought was normal. Going to visit dad on Sundays in prison was okay. Let's go. So I mean, your mom that had family outing. that was yeah. a family outing. That was a family outing. Let's go down and see dad in the orange jumpsuit yeah. and you know behind the thing. That was normal, and my mom acted like that was normal. So your so, mom had another child after you. With, yes, with, with the same, with same man? man. With the same man. My sister How old was is she? Uh, six years younger than me. Seriously, so they had this ongoing relationship. Yes, yes, Uh, yeah, they did until uh, they did for a long time. My mom went through a lot with my father. Yes, and they so she was with him for probably my sister. I'm 48. My sister's 42. Um, So yeah, till I was 21 and she was 15. Uh, they were one, as it was. It's funny. Once my dad cleaned up and got better, they broke up. Then you know, my, <laughs> I said to my mom, "Why'd you wait so long?" I mean, you know, you went through all this with him, yeah. stuck by him through prison, stuck by him years. through j- through jail. You stuck by him through all of that. But again, you know, my mom was a young. You know, she was she was a kid. She was 15 years old and probably her first love. Yeah. And, and so that that's what she knew and that's what she stuck with. You know, we're sitting here and we're having this conversation with all our viewers back at home, and it's really an important question. And the important question we have is we need to understand the problem first before we can even push towards the solution. And understanding the problem is why is it that African men are more likely, I think it's six times more likely to go into prison. Now someone's going to correct me on my stats because I may have got that wrong. 
But, but we know that they are more likely to go into prison. We know they're more likely to be arrested. We know they're more likely to have some form of challenge. Why is that the case? Why is it the case for Hispanic men to be more likely to go into prison than go away Caucasian or white men and women? Why is that situation a current day reality? We need to understand that question. Because in understanding it and identifying what the problems are and what the root causes of that problem, we can begin as a society to address it. Mm -hmm. But it is a question that is really critical for us. Now, I know a lot of people will say, well, it's, it's because we do racial, racial profiling. Mm -hmm. I know people, probably people will say is because it's one in four chances. One in four chances. Mm -hmm. uh, people will say, well, it's racial profiling. Or people will say because they live in poorer communities. Uh, people say because there's a lack of accessibility to education. Mm -hmm. People say because perhaps our health system is such that you need to be able to earn certain amounts of money, be able to have health insurance. And because of these systematic challenges, we create societies that are like ghettos. Mm -hmm. And we create these models of society that actually become prohibitive or less likely for talented, mm -hmm. capable young men and women to advance in society. Now, it's not simple. It's complex. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to ask the question, right? Well, well there are folks Brian, who, what do you there think? are folks will say that no, the systems are not inherently racist. The, the systems are not inherently rigged against people of color. And so, Justin, as, as one who can walk, you know, in both kind of mm -hmm. environments, black and white, and in also in white yes. and black systems, like, what's your take on that? What's your take on this modern discussion of surrounding race? What do you say to folks say, no, you just got to pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Uh, whatever opportunity that I have as a white man, you have the very same access to as a black man as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what is your take on that? Yeah, it, it's a conflicting take um, because I see both sides because because I've, I've grown up in both worlds and i think the inherent system i grew up in public housing i grew up in what you would call the ghetto that that was my mom when my mom was able to get her own place that's where i grew up at mm. so again watching the friends but i also had the opportunity then because my mom wanted something better for me and because of you know just god-given blessings that i was able to go to a system uh, of schooling that allowed me to to see another world Sure. And, and I think that that's what happens a lot in our society is we're only exposed to a certain world, especially in the African-American community. And I can speak to that. But was that, well, did you get access to that school, that better school, because of the, your skin tone? No, it was a choice. It was a choice that my mother made. It was, it was a choice that my mom said, you know, I want you to go to the, the Catholic parochial schools. And that, that was, you know, 99% white. And so I was there with kids whose parents were, were doctors and lawyers in our community, in our town. But I'd go home every night back to, you know, the public housing in the ghetto where I was seeing, you know, our, our, my friend's parents standing on the street corner selling drugs. So did she pay for that or did she just push you there? Like, how do you get into that school system? It you know, it, it was... It was a choice. It, it was a choice that my mother, you know, I think uh, at that time she was Catholic and the Catholic school system she knew was, was a little better than the public school system. I was on, you know, scholarship assistance every year. I, you know, I, I'll never forget. I was, you know, in the summer we'd have to do work. You know, I was out there picking of leaves and raking the lawns and cutting grass. At school? At school, you know, to pay for our tuition assistance. They, they, they had like a tuition work program. But, you know, that, that made you feel a little bit, you know, not the same as everyone else. Because you see the kids kind of get picked up by their parents and you're going to cut the grass. The kid picked up a yeah. nice car. Yeah, and, yeah, and they're wondering, why are you cutting the grass? <laughs> well, because so I can come here, you know. Yeah. And, and yeah. that was, so that, that kind of planted a little bit in your mind, too, that you weren't as good as they were. But I think for me, it was the exposure that I, I was able to not, I was able to leave my home, which was in public housing and Section 8 and, you know, public assistance and go out to nicer homes in nicer communities and expose me to things that were different. I got to talk to friends of mine's parents who were doctors or lawyers or, and, and I got to see something different that I wasn't seeing in, in my community. Yeah, I think we see that in Australia. There's a famous housing es um, estate called Claymore mm -hmm. and it's all public housing and they built a whole suburb of public housing and it was horrific mm -hmm. because you these kids ended up in a cycle their parents were in our mm. 
system. It's called the Dole, but they're on social support mm-hmm. and all this kind of stuff. And th- so they have kids on drugs. They have teenagers getting pregnant. They have fathers going to jail. Mm-hmm. They have people on welfare from beginning of their life until the end of their life. Their kids then follow the same thing. They all end up in this public housing mm-hmm. thing. And in the end, the Australian government went, no we are completely raising this suburb we're getting rid of it and the understanding that public housing mixed in amongst regular housing is the best way forward because kids don't get to see positive role models all they see is everybody just like them there's no way out there's no other option in life everybody in my life does this so i Mm -hmm. have to do that and i think you're right putting kids in a space where they can see you know what my life doesn't have to be this way i could be right Right, and, and that's and that's what where the, the the fortune happened in my life is that my mom, you know, for whatever reason, had that insight to say I, I'd like for him to have a better opportunity, and so you know whatever it took, whether it was, you know, her working extra or me cutting the grass, whatever it took for me to get in that, opened those doors for me, you know, and um, and I and I find that now even seeing you know my son and some of his friends that he plays football with, who live in uh, South Central Los Angeles, you know, we took recently we took a trip to the beach. And it was the first time they'd ever been to the beach. And yeah. you're thinking, you live in Southern California. And in South Central LA, you've never been to the beach. These yeah. are 9 and 10-year-old kids. Yeah. And, it's, and, and it, you know, it, it just blew me away, you know, how excited they were to see the ocean and just play in the sand. But they had never had the opportunity to leave you know, 10 miles away to go to the ocean. And, and, it's, and I was asking, I said, well, my parents, you know, my dad's not around. My mom's never, she's never she doesn't talk to us about going to the beach. And so I think it's almost a matter of just that, that exposure that we do, that we're the system almost sets us up that you know that that's not a part of our world. Well, they don't have to- the opportunity if if dad's not there and mum has to provide for her children, right? right she could be working two, three jobs. Right. I know per- people in this community who work two, three jobs to support their children. Mm-hmm. Uh, social life is not a thing. Right. It's not a thing. It's, it's not, not thing, an option. Yeah. Like, I'm trying to pay the bills. I'm trying to feed my kids. I'm trying to keep a, a roof over my head. Mm-hmm. And you want to talk about going to the park? Uh, you want to even think about going to the beach? That's that's just not right. part of it. You, you know, Cheryl, uh, I have been absolutely um, taken back by this concept of the working poor. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That we in a society that, because you know, one of the parameters that we often would use when you're helping people improve their lives is, well, get an education, get a job, but we have such an underclass of working poor. Um, And the question is, how do we actually as a society move forward? It, it it it's a it's a challenging question because you know what it was interesting when you look at scripture and you look at when Jesus charged the disciples with responsibilities to look after the widows to look after the orphans to look after the poor to look after the marginalized all the way through scripture from old testament even when the people of Israel were establishing the 12 tribes in the promised land of Cana there was a very clear mandate that there was to be land set aside for those who were refugees, those who were in prison, those who were the outcast of society. There was provision made for them. All the way through the Word of God, God's plan for humanity is to care for the poor, for the marginalized, for those on the it's kind of Yet the, our society doesn't seem to. I think it's kind of the opposite of capitalism. Capitalism is, you know, what I work for is mine, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm going to keep it. And if you can't work and get it, then I'm not sharing what I have with you. That's mine. I earned it. It's mine. I can do whatever I like with it. And I think this is where the kingdom of God comes on the other side of it and says, you know what, you've got a responsibility for your brother. Um, Jesus says to us, he says, you know, um, you have a responsibility to care for those who are less fortunate than yourself. You have a responsibility to feel mercy and compassion. You have a responsibility to treat people the way that you expect it to, to be treated. And it kind of runs in the face. And I think when we talk about the working poor, it's 
those of us in society who have much more than what we need, how am I responsibly dealing with what God has blessed me with to help those in society who may be in a different position than I am? And I'm not talking about just giving people stuff. I'm not talking about that because that doesn't work. What I'm talking about is how do we help people resolve some of the issues that they're facing? And I think so you're not talking about a welfare system. Uh, uh, that's, I think that's socialism. That's no, socialism. I'm, not, talking about, <laughs> are, are you I'm talking not even talking about socialism. I'm that's talking scary. about what Jesus says when he says that you have to have an awareness of what's going on in your in other people's lives. Mm-hmm. I keep coming back to William Booth when he's his last thing that he said when he was dying was others. Mm-hmm. Don't think of yourself more important than somebody else. Think of others first. But in our current climate today, I feel like American Christians, we're not thinking of others. We're thinking about ourselves more. It's revealing how selfish we really are. It's, yeah. it, it, it's it, like, I think it's calling us back. It's, right. it's, it's, so it's why like, do you think, hey, black why? people are on the streets. Well, hey, stop, stop burning down businesses. Because my capital is at stake, right. my assets are at stake, or right. or I, my freedom is being impin- infringed on because this wacky governor up in California, in Sacramento, is telling me I have to wear a mask, and so we're not otherizing. We're we're not thinking about others well, as people say. And Booth I think that's the, the the whole thing about the gospel is that God's love is for everyone. Right. The whole thing about the gospel is that Jesus died for everyone. That means that Jesus's blood covers everyone that means that jesus died for justin it means that jesus died for brian it means that jesus died for nurse and it means that jesus died for cheryl it means that we all matter to god exactly the same there is no one in god's kingdom who is more important than another there's nobody in god's kingdom who's going to have a a, a five-star mansion and then there's somebody else who's going to be sweeping the streets of heaven that's not how it's going to be and i think when we look back to the foundations of the salvation army that william booth was called by god in a specific space he was called by god for the others because the mainstream churches at that point in time were not dealing with the others and i think we're kind of back we've circled back again where we're not about the others we've forgotten about the others all we care about is me 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 and everybody else like me mm-hmm. and so when you hear stories of justin or you hear stories of nursing or we we look around at society and we see these great divisions it's because we we're not thinking about well, anybody else except for me let me ask you this question and brian can answer it as well um i think it's an important question well i think it's an important question <laughs> <laughs> we'll be the judge of that <laughs> you can tell me if you're not how should the Salvation Army respond to the question of others in this current context? And I think um, we've got to get called back to, our f- to the first purpose of the Salvation Army. And um, not that I want to like put William Booth up on a peasant stool or anything like that. Um, I think we need to give honour where it's due. And we have to remember our heritage. And our heritage is for the least, the last and the lost. That's what God called us to. That's what um, raised the Salvation Army up from. And I think the minute that we get away from that, then God says, you know what? I I hear you. That's our identity. Our identity is what matters. Because everybody else can do what we do. But not everybody else can serve the others. And, and, and for God's kingdom, and, and you talked about it a minute ago, from the very foundations of God's family, he talked about thinking about those who are outside of the norm. He talked about the alien. He talked about the refugee. He talked about the widow. He talked about the poor. He talked about the women. He talked about people of different races. Jesus, even God, way back in the Old Testament, talks about all of those people on the margins of society. And he says things like, make sure you take care of them. Don't reap everything in your harvest. Leave a little bit behind for those who don't own any property. Treat people in your service well. Jesus says, love like you expect to be loved. And I think 
others become central to God's kingdom. Everybody's important. Yeah. You've got to so, bring the others in. As a Salvation Army, should we then love and serve illegal immigrants? As a Salvation Army, should we uh, elevate the voices of the Black Lives Matter movement? If these are all, these are, are the, the modern day marginalized, right? Well, I don't so, think, I, I think one of the people that you talked about is, is the marginalized. I think when you start talking about um, political groups like the Black Lives Matters, I go, no, 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 no. Well, not the organization, but no, just no, the No, no, I'm talking about, I, I would say it's people who don't fit in society, who who don't have, a, have the same voice as others. And I think that's where we need to park ourselves. We need to put... Um, political groupings and all of that stuff aside and we need to actually look at who are the people here who are suffering who are the people here who don't matter so in a sense it's like going back into where Justin's neighborhood was where yeah. you saw the single mother with um, with the child struggling to make ends meet yeah. you see uh, uh, areas of our society you know in central LA or in in some of the more marginalized parts of our community and say, listen, what are we doing in those communities? Are we allocating sufficient resources to areas of greatest needs? Now, I, I, I think there's those parts of community all over. I think we just become blind to it. And I think the thing that we have to ask God for is to open my eyes to see the things that you see. Open my ears to listen. Break my heart for the things that break your heart. It, it becomes less about what matters to me and completely about what matters to God. And I think that's where we need to park ourselves. God, show me, show me, show me. What would you respond in saying, Justin? I mean, uh, the conversation has taken to another yeah. path. What what would you say from your perspective, looking back in hindsight, mm -hmm. seeing the struggles, seeing the issues? You know, I, I think that, you know, from my perspective, it goes back to, as, as Brian mentioned, you know, the getting our minds off of ourselves. I think we, we're in a society that promotes, you know, self-promotion it promotes uh, everything from taking selfies to everything's about us and not about others and so you know in my house you know i've been just starting with my own self and, and looking at my heart as captain Cheryl just put it you know i'm asking god to let my heart break for what breaks yours lord mm -hmm. and i think that's what we have to go is start with each other one 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 at a time in our own lives and look inside of ourselves and seeing, you know, what am I doing to help others? Is everything that I'm striving for, is everything that I'm doing in life all about me and building myself up? Or is it about me helping others up? And just going back to, you know, the community that we that I grew up in, you know, the ones who made it out uh, were the ones that were helped by, by others. You know, we were helped by someone else. Yeah. We didn't get out on our own, you know, and I think that that's one of the biggest pieces that how we break that cycle is we start to give back and help pull each other out one, in, one by one. The Salvation Army had a really, really great tagline, heart to God, hand to man. Mm. Uh, it's a powerful image, <laughs> isn't it? Um, which is, Brian, what would you say? I mean, this is an important question. How, as a Salvation Army, uh, can we be the Salvation Army for others in our present context? Yeah, I think... It, it, we're looking for the least, last, and the lost. We're looking for the marginalized. We're looking for the others. And, and I think one of the things that I've been struggling with as um, as a pastor that has recently come on staff with the Salvation Army is distinct, making a distinction between movement and church. Are we a movement today? Or are we a church? Now, one is not bad, greater than the other. Both are necessary. But... Um, there is that uh, the inner monologue, the inner discussion that I've been having is like, do I want to be a part of a movement or do I want to be a part of sustaining a church? Um, I think the reason why one of the first one of the main reasons why I first entered the Salvation Army is because it was birthed by William Booth. And he, as so far as I understand, he didn't want to give birth to a church. He started a movement. Correct. I was like, dude, this guy sounds like. This guy sounds like the original gangster, man. I'm, I'm sign me up, you know. If this is what he did, then I want to do the same. Um, but as things go, you find out that 
movements with each generation slowly become kind of institutions, institutions and churches, right? And so I guess for me personally, as a cog in this whole Salvation Army thing, um, what can I do to um, cause this church to morph back into a movement? Mm. But, but the, what the challenges that I'm finding is that there are many within our army world who are fine and content and satisfied with it being a church. And so I wonder, I wonder uh, what the future trajectory of the army is as a whole. And if it remains as a church, that's fine, to God's glory, yes and amen. But is it in the cards for the army to ever become a movement again in the way that reflects the first generation of salvationists? Right, um, so that, that's personally kind of what I've been wrestling with as a Salvationist. I'm a I'm a card carrying soldier. I don't wear my uniform all the time, but I do occasionally. Um, I believe in the movement, in the spirit of what the army is about, and I and I. But I do wonder. I do wonder. I wrestle with the idea. Well, have we lost that 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 first generation fire? And and if so, how do we recapture that? You know, Brian, um, uh, people have often said that, and I, and, I, and I take it on board and recognize it and acknowledge, yes, uh, the Salvation Army, we have some enormous challenges ahead of us. Uh, Bryce Courtney, in his phenomenal book called The Power of One, in it, uh, the character PK, uh, it, it's, it's birth in South Africa. So I use a lot of South African analogies and examples. And... His teacher, because he wants to start to teach the African kids English. And in that time and in that zone, it was illegal to do that. It was against the policies of the government. And his teacher says to PK, PK, what can you accomplish by having this one class for African children? So he said, sir... How many drops of water does it take to start a water fountain? And the teacher responds to him and says, very clever, PK, very clever. Because see, the reality, friends, is that it just takes the power of one. If one person says, I'm prepared to be what God has called me to be, then we can change and shape the world. Cheryl preached a sermon a few weeks ago, and it still sits and resonates in my heart and spirit. She says, we're waiting for God to move, but we have failed to realize that we are the move of God in this time and this age. So we're wrapping up our conversation again today, and I want to share with you, our viewers and those who are listening, if you're asked the question, what can I do? My encouragement is be that move of God where you are right now. What can you do? You can have the conversation with your neighbor. What can you do? Where you see injustice, be a voice of justice. What can you do? Where you see hopelessness, be an agent of hope. You see, the power of love, the power of one, is far more powerful than you and I realize. Nelson Mandela said, the greatest fear is not that you are inadequate, but you are more powerful than you realize. Paul says in the ch to the church of Ephesus in Ephesians 1, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be open, that you may see that the same power that was used to raise Jesus from death to life is within you. You are powerful. You are powerful beyond description. So be a force of power in this world because your voice matters. God's blessings upon you. We pray for your family. Join us next week, 2.30, Friday afternoon, as we continue our sacred conversation. And we want to say a big thank you to Justin, yeah. our guest thank you for today. Thank you, Justin, for being with us. We have loved you. It's always great to have Brian and Cheryl because they keep me balanced. So blessings. Well, friends, what an incredible time we've had together. Thank you so much, Justin Coleman, for sharing your heart and your personal story. Wow. 
what an impact that has had on my life and my view on things. Thank you so much. Uh, what a great conversation we had today between uh, Generations Pastor Brian Yee, uh, Captains Nurson and Cheryl Kiston, and our very own friend from Orange County, Justin Coleman. Um, thank you so much for tuning in, guys. We're going to be back uh, next week for our sacred conversations. And don't forget to tune in for the midweek message on Wednesdays. Um, that's going to be brought to you live at 6 p.m. Stay tuned for that. And don't forget Sunday. I mean, we have our church service here on Sunday mornings. Uh, it's going to be online, and we can't wait to see you online. Be blessed.